Dr Merton, thanks very much for your time today. What will be the UK's reaction if the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison decides not to attend the Glasgow summit? We're encouraging all leaders to attend uh, the summit in Glasgow in less than a month's time. We've now got over 120 world leaders confirmed to attend. So we're encouraging all leaders to come. And uh, my, the COP26 president designate, Alec Sharma, the other day just made clear how, how keen he is that Australia comes to the summit and that Scott Morrison takes part uh, because climate change is the issue of our time. And it's important that world leaders stand together in addressing this issue. What would the UK like to see from Australia at the summit? So we're encouraging all countries uh, around the world to, to make clear uh, emissions reductions targets as part of our commitment to tackling climate change. The job in Glasgow is not to negotiate a new uh, climate change treaty that was done at Paris. The job at Glasgow is to demonstrate that the Paris Treaty, which is so strong because nearly every country in the world um, has ratified the agreement and is committed to enacting it, it can work but it relies on voluntary mechanisms to deliver it. It relies on countries setting ambitious targets of their own to reduce their emissions so that we can limit the rise in global temperatures. So we're encouraging all countries, and Australia is no exception, to set clear long-term targets for how they will bring their emissions to, to in balance with their natural sinks, to net zero in other words, and also clear short-term goals, nationally determined contributions if we use the UN lingo, to that make clear how they will reduce emissions along that pathway by 2030. Well, the Australian government's position is technology, not taxes, uh, are the way to, have, uh, to achieve emissions targets. How does that square with what other countries around the world are doing? So I think all countries in the world believe in technology as, as the way to uh, tackle um, the, the climate change problem. And my own prime minister is, has become very fervent in this regard. And we've got a right of centre government here in the UK. And our prime minister is now committed, for example, to the UK becoming the Saudi Arabia of offshore wind with the world's leaders producer, uh, of offshore, leading producer of offshore wind. And we want to produce more. And just two days ago, he was making clear at the Conservative Party conference in Manchester that he wants the UK to become a zero emission electricity grid by 2035. And we think technology is an important part of that. Is it possible for nations to get to a net zero position without pricing carbon? Carbon pricing is happening around the world. Even China now has an emissions trading scheme. And actually, carbon pricing is an efficient way of lowering your emissions in the most cost effective economic way possible. Uh, you've seen the European Union have announced that they will be uh, coming forward with detailed proposals for a carbon border adjustment mechanism. And as more and more of the world moves towards uh, zero carbon targets, and over 70% of the world's GDP is now committed to net zero, um, then carbon pricing will become more and more of a reality. So it's, it's right to prepare for it. So what will happen to countries that don't commit to a net zero target? Will there be any kind of sanctions or, or difficulties for them? I don't think anyone's talking about sanctions, but I think what we're saying is that actually this is the way the world is going. Um, Australia has huge opportunities for export uh, in the zero emission space. And I know that there are sort of these targets high H2 for under two, uh, and you've got huge plans to export uh, zero emission electricity to, to Southeast Asia and to the region and your major trading partners like Japan and Korea who've set net zero targets of their own. But your, your credibility as an exporter is going to be that much stronger if you're on a net zero journey of your own. The major economies of the world are likely to fall short of halving the global emissions this decade needed to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Against that backdrop, what should the goal of Glasgow be? What would a successful but realistic outcome look like? So at Glasgow, we have to show the world that we are bending the emissions curve uh, and that we, we, we're taking global emissions and sending them on a downward trajectory uh, to reach net zero around mid-century. Now, it's clear that there may be a gap between where we need to be at 20, by 2030 and, and what countries pledge in terms of their NDCs and their long-term strategies. So one of the things that we have to do at Glasgow is demonstrate that there are credible ways in which we can close that gap. So um, my prime minister often talks about coal, cash, cars and trees. And what he's referring to is sectoral collaboration to allow us to advance technology in key sectors and deliver on our climate goals. There's a false distinction between technology and targets. It's not an either or. Actually, one can drive the other. If you set an ambitious target, that sends a really clear signal to investors. Uh, investors put money in the sector, they develop the technology, and that enables you to meet your target in a virtuous circle.
Dr Merton, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lee Sales. Thanks for watching this story. If you'd like to watch more of 7.30's stories, they are on the left of your screen. And tap on the button below to subscribe and get the latest from ABC News.